What is up and welcome back everyone. I'm Jake Landau joined by my good friend and soccer super nerd Thomas Godden. This is the It's Called Soccer podcast where the only thing more consistent than our takes is Gio Reyna's corner kicks. Today we're diving headfirst into Reyna's Forest debut and his pivotal assist. Did someone say career defining moment? Speaking of career defining moments, it seems like Josh Sargent just continues to have them to score and is making ways in Norwich. But hold your applause, please, because we've got mailbag questions that are burning hotter than Weston McKinney's contract negotiations at Juve. And for the faster and forward fans, certainly not me, um, you'll get a kick out of Pepe's latest shoot. Yes, it's exactly what you're imagining. So today we're covering the biggest stories for the week in U.S. soccer and adding a new segment where we're answering your questions straight from the Discord server. Before we get started, I have one huge ask of you all, if you are watching or listening, please, 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 could you go to wherever you're listening to your podcast and leave a positive review for the It's Called Soccer podcast. It is by far the easiest and largest impact you can have on the growth of this show. If you're watching on YouTube, it would still be super helpful if you could do that and drop a review. But leave us a comment for next week's mailbag if you want to on YouTube. Tom is currently risking his life in the middle of a thunderstorm to record this. What's up, Tom? How's the weather over there? Um, extremely rainy. It wasn't an hour ago. It was a beautiful hour ago. Now it is pitch black outside and you'll hear ominous thunder strikes throughout the entire recording every time I have a bad take. So the weather is currently conspiring against me. But other than that, have, feeling good, having a great time. Glad to be here. How are you doing, Jake? I'm doing great. I'm starting my new job tomorrow, so I'm yeah. really excited about that. Uh, I guess it will be today whenever anyone is <laughs> listening to this. Um, but I'm sure the thunderstorm will give us a nice environmental sounds for while we talk about our different topics. Okay, on to the soccer. Gio Reyna started his first game for Nottingham Forest since joining on loan from Borussia Dortmund. And surprise, surprise, he got an assist. Um, it was his first goal contribution, so it was an assist off a corner kick. And Tom, we discussed last week his move to Forest from you know a substitute at a Champions League squad like Dortmund to a substitute at a relegation candidate for Forest. Is this a critical moment for Reyna's career? Is that assist, is that going to mean anything? Because in the blink of an eye, he has become an old man at 21 years old. I don't know. I, I think that there's still so much time for him to figure out, figure out, figure out where his club situation is going to be. We've seen from players like Pulisic that your development's not linear. Your career trajectory is not linear. You'll have good seasons. You'll have down seasons. If Gio is the player that we think he is, I trust him to figure it out eventually. I, I, I have no doubts that he will find a good landing spot at the end of this loan, whether that's at Dortmund, whether that ends up being somewhere else next year. Who knows? But, you know, it's good to see him get on the score sheet. It was a fantastic assist. Great to see that set piece delivery paying off for him and hopefully he gets more minutes. That's all really I care about right now. I mean, for Gio, like his performance was pretty good outside of the assist. The assist off a corner kick, pretty surprising to me that he was taking dead ball situations, the corner kicks, some of the free kicks. And a lot of times it feels like people discount assists when they come from corner kicks just because like it's a matter of numbers, right? You take enough you're going to get an assist eventually. But at the same time, it feels like his delivery is far and above everybody else, at least for the U.S. men's national team. Was this something that we need to take back to the national team? Do you think Gio Reyna should be taking the free kicks for the U.S.? It's a bit surprising he doesn't take more of them. Like the last game, was it, was it Malik Tillman who was blasting balls over the bar? Like that was surprising when you have both Pulisic and Reyna on the field. If Pulisic wants them, it's hard to argue with him, but it doesn't seem like... Pull a six delivery is consistent enough for a national team, so maybe it's time to give Gio a look at the permanent spot. But again, how do you argue with Christian Pulisic on something like this? You argue by showing him the stats to say <laughs> that he's not as good as Gio Reyna, and if he wants to do the best thing for the team, then maybe Gio Reyna should, should take those free kicks. Um, now, again, people discount these assists coming from corners. Gio's assists with the U.S. national team recently have been just incredible line-breaking passes that show his vision, his technique, his ability. Is this enough, at least at Forest, to continue getting more minutes, or was this just kind of rotation? Did he do enough with his performance, do you think, to warrant more starts with this club? I hope he did. I mean, it feels like they could use him. It doesn't seem like, what have you got to lose at this point if you're not even Forest? You've got a really tough, stref- st- tough stretch coming up. You're fighting for your life here. It seems like any goal contributions you can get from players like Gio are just worth it, especially if he's going to put in defensive work off the ball like he has been recently. So 
I don't know. It's it seems like they should be trying this, trying to give him as many minutes as they can, at least off the bench, to try and keep themselves afloat. It seems like such a weird one because, on one hand, Gio Reyna does produce so many goals, like when he gets those minutes, and on the other, he is on loan. So when you say why wouldn't Nottingham Forest use him, I guess that's the argument: is that any development that he's going to have outside of that goal production is not going to pay back in for Nottingham Forest as a club because they're essentially giving him the minutes that Dortmund is going to use to sell him later or potentially go back to Dortmund and be a key player that we all think he can be. So that's I guess that's just not even the devil's advocate, but from a club's perspective, maybe why he's not getting that. as many minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Counterpoint to that, how much is it worth if he scores the goal that keeps them up or has the assist that keeps them up? $150 million? Yeah, like it's way more that? than he's going to go for from <laughs> Dortmund. Like, <laughs> it's very like, true. Like the you do whatever you can to stay up, and if Reyna can get you any goal contributions towards that mark, then like, why are we not playing him? This doesn't seem like a hard decision to make if you think he can contribute at the current moment. Like, yeah, you won't get to sell him, but if you get to stay in the Premier League, it's worth a lot of money to you. It's so true, and like even if it's a loan, right? You're kind of paying for the opportunity to use this young player that has the potential that you think can give you something now and you're right if he scores the goal or gives the assist that keeps Nottingham Forest up that's worth 150 million so your investment that you paid Dortmund is coming back probably what like a hundredfold for whatever (laughs) they they pay Dortmund for the loan usually too with loans you pay a certain percentage of the wages so it would all be worth it it would be a sound financial investment I think I'm saying this as a non-biased, you know, U.S. <laughs> fan that Gio Reyna should be getting more minutes at Forest, mostly because I want to see him on TV and yes. have to wa- not have to watch, um, you know, Sheffield United for Austin Trusty every weekend. Yeah, no, it would be nice, but you know, it, we'll see what happens in the near future. It seems like the pressure from Forest fans themselves is growing for him to play, so I don't think that they're going to be dodging the question of Gio getting minutes at this point. The assist definitely helps with that. I think it helps endear him to the fans. His work rate was pretty good as well. Like I know we always kind of talk about, is this going to come at some moment? He's 21 now. He kind of jumped into the scene at 16, 17. And all of us U.S. fans have kind of been saying, yeah, he's he's obviously good enough to be an attacking midfielder. But that position in itself has kind of left the modern game. You need to have that defensive wherewithal. You need to have the effort, the action in the game. I felt like Gio Reyna did that for Forrest. So we'll see what happens. But from my my perspective, like he needs to be getting way more minutes for Forrest at this point. Yeah, I agree. All right, staying on the big island, Tom, Josh Sargent. One, one tier down from the Premier League in the championship. Josh Sargent was back for Norwich midweek with DJ Khaled as a special. Another one, another goal for Josh Sargent. Um, we had a mailbag question from Iman in the Discord. Tom, if we bring Balogun, Pepe, Sargent, and Haji Wright to Copa America, who gets left off the roster to make room for all four forwards? For me, just based on what we brought to Copa to the Nations League, we had uh, we only brought three wingers. One of them was Malik Tillman, who's actually a midfielder, um, and we brought three strikers. It seems like you just need to pick one name, one single name to remove from the roster. And for me, that seems to be your backup left back. It seems like it's the weakest position on the team. You have guys like McKenny and Weah who can play right back. You have uh, Haji and Sargent have both played on the wing before, can both deputize there if you need to eat minutes. Tillman can play there. If your Geo could play there in a pinch, you could bring Brendan Aronson and play him there in a pinch. It just sort of feels like you go with versatility and you take off your backup left back because you have so much coverage for that position from other sources. Even our right backs can play left back. So in a pinch, it feels... Does that sort of seem to make sense? I guess on this roster, be Christopher Lund? I think so. And that's the exact question I was about to ask you. Is that Lund? Is that Joe Scally? Is that somebody else that we're not really considering right now? For me, that's Lund because Scally is our sort of backup right back. It seems like there's a pretty clear cliff between Jedi, Surge, Scally, and then everyone else. Yeah. And so it sort of makes sense to cut it there for me. I know we don't have like the same pull towards Christopher Lund yet just because we haven't seen him as many times with the national team, but I've really liked what I've seen when he mm-hmm. has been on the pitch for us. Like mm-hmm. He's playing in Serie B, so same 
division as Tanner Tessman and Gianluca Busio, who we'll talk about in a second as well. But it feels like he's not at the tier where like he's indispensable like some of mm-hmm. our other guys. He probably yeah. is on the bubble of that 23. And if you're going to bring four forwards, it's probably going to be Lund. I mean, Josh Sargent, 15 goals and one assist this season in 1,600 minutes. So essentially one goal contribution for, per 100 minutes. Mm-hmm. That's just an insane rate of scoring. And you add that with Ricardo Pepe, his rate of scoring per 90. It's just kind of crazy what our forwards have been able to do this season. Even Balogun, who's like a little bit more quiet this season with Monaco, he's still got multiple, multiple goals and is an important player for them. It's such a turnaround from last year. It's crazy. Like the striker position used to be something we were incredibly worried about. Like before the World Cup, how many minutes did we spend talking about how like nervous we were about what strikers were going to be? How many arguments did we go like see on the internet about who were going to be the strikers, who should be called to play striker, how terrible our striker options were? Now it seems like it's one of the strengths of the team. And it started in scoring almost a goal per 90. That's crazy. Like he just absolutely cannot stop. It feels like our strikers all need to move up a level almost just because of how well they're doing, or at least the ones in the championship. Do you think Haji yeah. and Sargent are probably ready to go to the Premier League? I think so. And I, I genuinely think both of them are going to get interest from like maybe the Brentford level teams. Mm-hmm. Brentford's, I mean, an interesting case just because their their scouting is world class, right? Like they might yeah. not be playing in Champions League, but they are essentially the one of the best buying and selling clubs in Europe along with Brighton. Um, But Brighton's starting to get up there. Like I would expect that Brighton is kind of elevating themselves into the European places more consistently. But again, like 16 gold contributions in 1600 minutes. How do you write? We talked about him last week. I think he's like 20 plus goals so far this season. That it goal contributions is just like 15 goals or something like that. But he's got a bunch of assists too. Yeah, so like that in itself is enough, I think, to catch the eye of, hey, how'd you write? You've come from Turkey back to the championship. You've proven yourself. You're capable of playing at this higher level. Josh Sargent, you've had your fill of injuries and like moments where you haven't been able to play, but when you've gotten the minutes, it's been insanely productive. Even his time at Norwich, like that was probably up there with Sheffield as one of the worst Premier League teams ever. And he was playing right wing. He was playing out of position. He still had that insane, like, back heel goal. I, f- I forget who it was against, but... It was... Oh, uh, it was... Uh, Watford. It was against a big team, I feel no, like. No, it was, it was Watford. That was that two-goal game Watford. where he had the scorpion kick and the other goal right after he became a father. Yeah, so he's just going to become the father of the rest of the Premier League at this point. <laughs> I, I do yeah. think like both of them have done enough this season to answer your question in a yeah. very long and non-eloquent way. I mean, <laughs> they're Haji ready Wright, for that next level. This is Haji Wright's fourth season in a row across three different countries with ten plus goal contributions. He every time he moves up the level, he continues to show that he can do it. So it seems like you just keep moving him up all level until he can't do it anymore. It's true. It's so true. I love the championship for our guys too. Like that yeah. seems like such a good proving ground and. Again, I know we just kind of shat on Austin Trusty, but his his move to Arsenal and then loan to Birmingham just kind of gave him like this time to settle into the physical league, the the way that English football works. Like it made him into a Premier League center back. Maybe not a great one, but but he is one. You can't take that away from him. So I just love the championship as a league. Mm-hmm for our players to go to and kind of prove themselves and jump off from there. It seems like it goes one of two ways. It either goes really well and players get a chance to prove themselves or they get hurt and they end up never making into the national team picture again. I hope that's not the case for Daryl DK. Yeah, but it's other players too. Paul Ariola, Jordan Morris sort of had their chance and got injured and it didn't work out for them. That's the other way it can go. And that's, that's the only drawback to the championship for me. Very true. I mean, when you're playing you know, 89 games uh, <laughs> between the FA Cup, the League Cup, and your league. And, and the, everyone's oh, so just grinding. Physical. Like, they're not, yeah. like, they're not cupcake games either. Speaking of someone that couldn't really hang in the Premier League, but we know he's better than that, Weston McKinney, um, his <laughs> contracts with Juve. We need to talk about this because apparently, um, even though Weston McKinney's contract goes till the end of 2025, 
Juve have offered him a new contract with a reduced salary. Weston is apparently upset, and there are reports that Weston is going to be on the trading block for Juventus, even though he's arguably been the most important player for them this year. Can Weston go back to the Premier League and possibly a club who loves a free agent, maybe somewhere like Brighton? Is that the place to go, or has Weston kind of played out his time in the Premier League and it's time to go somewhere else? I don't think you can count the Leeds load against him. Like, that was a weird loan situation. It was a horrible relegation fodder club. I think that if you give him a chance in the Premier League, if there's anyone I think who can sort of buck the American stereotype that seems so rife in the Premier League, is Weston McKinney. Um, It seems like it's he's the guy to sort of try it again, and I think he can make it work. However, I think that he could look at other leagues. I think that he would be a really good piece in La Liga. I think that he could go back to the Bundesliga to a Champions League side and have a lot of success there. I'm not betting against McKenney. Like anywhere he goes, he's going to make it into a side and he's going to do well. So why not try the Premier League? But if not, then there are options for him out there. Where do you think the perfect landing spot is? I think it's really interesting. You just mentioned the Bundesliga. Like Leverkusen is probably going to be losing a few players after winning the Bundesliga and ending Bayern Munich's domination over a decade plus of winning the Bundesliga in a row. Um, So where is the perfect landing spot, do you think, for Weston? I could see him fitting in at like like a Champions League chasing Spanish side, like maybe Sevilla or something like that, or maybe even Leverkusen or someone who's in the same position in the Bundesliga. I don't see him play at one of the Giants in either of those leagues, but I don't know. He's proved us wrong before. He's played at Juventus for the last two years, and he's arguably their best piece. So, you know, maybe he could go to like to a big club. Maybe Atletico Madrid would be a good fit for him. I, that sort of seems like his style of play. It's kind of wild that we're talking about this in the sense of big clubs because Schalke, the club that he came up with, is now potentially going to be relegated into the third Bundesliga. And they are historically one of the largest clubs in Germany and my how they have fallen so I'm I'm glad Weston McKinney has kind of gotten out of that situation but um, what a ride it's been for this guy yeah I mean he's got the pieces he's got the work rate he's got the attitude that it just seems like wherever he goes he's gonna make it work he's just I mean he's just such a talented player his aerial ability is so good he's sneakily really good on the ball so yeah I I, I expect that wherever he lands he's gonna end up succeeding post Juventus yeah we need his uh secret agent to step up and start leaking more things yeah I'm calling out 29 right now <laughs> <laughs> we we need to know where his next destination is there were mentions that like non-european clubs were interested it, it feels like that would be a mistake for him it would be and at the same time I feel like and this is without any personal information or inside info i feel like he would be one of the u.s players that would be most prone to go to like saudi arabia or yeah. somewhere to make a lot of money and yeah. like more power to him but mm-hmm. I, I feel like weston mckinney would be one of the few players in the u.s setup that would potentially take one of those moves yeah i agree but saudi arabia is kind of slowing their role in, mm-hmm. in buying players so maybe that's good news and the rest of europe can catch up i would i would really want him to stick around Europe in some capacity. Like you can't be one of the best players for Juve and then fall off the face of the earth. There, yeah. There is a team and there is a talent there that mm-hmm. is going to be able to add something. Yeah, no, definitely. And who knows? I think really we're about to enter silly season with rumors around him. It'll be fun to follow. Speaking of silly season, maybe not a season, but Ricardo Pepe's fashion shoot, Tom, we got to talk about this. It's it's obviously, you know, it's the biggest story in U.S. soccer right now. Um, after his last week's fiasco, where his agent made it publicly known that Ricardo Pepe was not happy with his playing time, Ricardo Pepe appeared in a fashion shoot, which is, I mean, maybe I'm just old, but it's quite hilarious. And Pepe, this weekend, was not on the team sheet for PSV's 6-0 win over Vitesse, in which his countryman Malik Tillman scored his seventh of the season. So for Pepe... Was it an injury? Was it his agent's comments about playing time? Or was it just that his photo shoot was so horrible that his coach had to bench him? It's weird that PSV would let him go to a photo shoot two days before a match. Like, what was the, the, was this part of, is he holding out now to get more playing time? Is he actually hurt? It's weird. I, I really don't understand 
the, the decision making by either PSV to let him go or Pepe to sort of say, no, I want to go anyway. Like, this is just a strange, strange decision by everyone involved. You think he's taking an NFL approach to, <laughs> to locking himself out? That would be hilarious. We need some more good, like, player drama around the U.S. We haven't had any in a while. It's time for another really good dramatic uh, story. And this feels like it's reaching that point. Although, there were other big names at that photo shoot. Sam Kerr was there. She's currently hurt. Emma Hayes was there. Maybe. Who knows? I, I actually do think, now that you say that, there was also another advertising piece where Ricardo Pepe was advertising for the Summer Olympics. So potentially that was part of it. I hope Ricardo Pepe is not going to wear what he wore in the photo shoot to the Summer Olympics. Um, actually, going back to one of our, <laughs> yeah, one of our conversations where we were taking four strikers to Copa America, I feel like Ricardo Pepe being in an advertisement for the Summer Olympics does have some underlying uh, sayings for us, thinking about who's going to make it into the Olympic roster. Do you feel like, at least for the Olympics versus Copa America, Ricardo Pepe, with his age, with his production, is it better for him to go to the Olympics rather than Copa America if we do have three other strikers that are in form? I think it makes sense. I mean, if we have as crazy form, if this form continues, then, like, sure, drop the guy who's playing as a backup right now. Um, that makes sense to me. You can get a lot of what Pepe does from a combination of Balogun, Sargent, and Wright. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely options there. Pepe seems like a good fit for the Olympic roster, and there's not really a young striker coming up behind him. So you either have to spend on an overage player, a Jesus Ferreira, uh, Brandon Vasquez, or you have to spend that spot on someone like Pepe. And so it feels like it fills a need for both for the Olympic team and also like solves a problem for the main team. So it kind of makes a lot of sense. I will not stand for this Giassi Zardes slander, <laughs> Tom. How can I'll that not the be your I'll call, call him up, Greg. Call him up. <laughs> <laughs> or whoever, Do you think Greg is going to be coaching the Olympic? No, it'll be Mikey Varas. Okay. So Mikey Varas, call him up. Yeah. That's, <laughs> call up Mikey. that's one of our three senior. Yeah. Do it, Mikey. You won't. You won't. <laughs> I have a, I have a t-shirt somewhere with Zardes' face on it. I'll, I'll wear it every single time the U.S. plays the Olympics if we call him up. I think you do make a really good point because for anyone that doesn't know in the Olympics, you get uh, everyone has to be under 23, but you get three overage players to bring on the roster. Ricardo Pepe is currently 21 years old. So I feel like from the list of our strikers, he does make the most sense. You don't have to spend an overage player on him. He's in form one of the most important positions at a tournament and a knockout is going to be a striker that can put in goals that and a goalkeeper that's hot. So I, I agree. Like people aren't going to want to hear it because Pepe is genuinely good enough to be, you know, in the race to be the top two or three strikers for the U S senior team. But I think going to the Olympics being one of the best, most important players for this team and, and a, a team that's going to be loaded. Like, the U.S. has mm -hmm. never had a U23 team where almost everyone is getting major minutes in a professional league. So Ricardo Pepe has a chance to lead the line. The U.S., I mean, the Olympics, Tom, I feel like it's going to be one of the major tournaments where we actually have a chance to do some damage, notwithstanding Copa America coming up this summer. It, it There's a real opportunity there. I, I don't, I was really way more excited about it before I realized who was hosting it because um, I feel like that sort of, sets the clear bar as to who is going to win Perry, this tournament and who yeah France. Paris is hosting it France gets an automatic bid and you've got to figure they're going to call up three just ridiculous U20 like over 23 players to play on the side like do you think Mbappe I plays I mean Giassi Zardes gets <laughs> into the U23 team Kylian Mbappe is really the only natural response to that from the French right I mean fair yeah absolutely he's the only one who can go goal for goal for him at a tournament like this but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I France is going to be the clear favorites. They're going to call up some just insane talent for this team, and it's going to be sort of a race for second, I feel like, behind them. So I don't see why we couldn't be that number two team in this tournament. I feel like they don't even have to call up senior players. They have enough U23s that are playing at PSG or in the Premier League or in Liga that mm -hmm. are just going to completely dominate. But I feel like we talk about that in every single time that there's a youth tournament or a youth World Cup. And the youth team that had Serginho Dest and Timothy Way on it 
We beat France in a knockout game a few mm-hmm. years ago. So anything can happen. Anything can happen mm-hmm. in the knockouts. All right, Tom. Speaking of knockouts, Emily Fox wins She Believes Cup for the U.S. Women's National Team with a final penalty shootout. Um, the U.S. tied Canada 2-2. It was another Nair masterclass in the penalty kicks. Okay. One of the last tune-ups before the Olympic Games. How are we feeling after this nervy final? I would be feeling a lot better if there was VAR in that game. Um, I don't really feel like Crystal Dunn made any contact on that last penalty. I don't think that that was a penalty. I think the U.S. probably deserved to win that in regulation. But, you know, that said, Sophia Smith gets off the mark again with two goals. Trinity Rodman and... Uh, um, Mallory Swanson both look like they're back to their old selves. You have players like Katarina Macario who are starting to come back into health. It feels like things are trending up, at least in the attack for the U.S., and that's a really good sign moving into the Olympics. Also, yeah. you can't like not shout out Nair here. She's been insane in penalties over the last year. Scoring and saving. She's three of three converting pens in our last three penalty shootouts, and she's made at least one save in each of them, three saves in both of the last two against Canada. That's an insane, insane <laughs> stat. Like, she's an amazing knockout keeper. It, it's it's a moment where I feel like she's just salivating and, like, rubbing her hands together whenever we get into penalty kicks. She's like, yes, mm-hmm. this is this is my moment. It's my time. It is. Tom, I'm not sure if you, you saw the, the comments from Emma Hayes after her altercation with the Arsenal manager, Jan Zaydeval. It was a bit weird. Um, Emma Hayes essentially pushed Jan Zaydeval after the game. And in her press conference a few days later, she uh, recited a poem. And then she talked about how her son was upset with her for, for pushing him. And it was, it was just very weird. It was a very weird press conference. Um, this is coming off the back, too, of her comments where she had to backtrack on saying that players shouldn't have relationships with other players on the team. Like, Emma Hayes, before all of these comments and before the microscope was on her, was the obvious choice for best manager to come in and be the U.S. Women's National Team's next manager. Now that we have this kind of time and space to evaluate, and she's over there with Chelsea about to come to the U.S. Women's National Team, the Olympics will be her first tournament with the team. Has your view changed at all on Emma Hayes? Not yet. No, I and I think that she's still the best. She's the best women's manager in the world right now. It, it seems like she should be the one to lead the team. The comments are a little strange, but we've had strange managers before. So um, it, it <laughs> give us weird. Give us Bruce Arena <laughs> version two for the women's team. Bruce Arena with better tactics. That's but I don't know. It, That's all be... you could ask for. That's the perfect <laughs> manager. <laughs> But yeah, we might be regretting these saying this in a few months, but I don't know. Give her the, give her the reins and see what she can do. I'm excited to see her with this just insanely stacked level of talent. I mean, think about how much just raw talent she's about to have at her disposal. It's going to be really, really fun to watch her coach this woman's team. We need uh, everyone that's watching to hold us to this conversation when... <laughs> eventually something crashes and burns. But um, I just want to take us around the world for a second before we get to the mailbag. Yunus Musa started and had an assist to Rafael Leao in AC Milan's 3-3 draw away at Sassuolo. AC Milan rotated a bit uh, with their second leg Europa League clash this week with Roma on the horizon. Actually lost that first leg. Um, it also meant that Pulisic had a substitute appearance featuring for the last 25 minutes. Board manager said that Tyler Adams should be available next week with his back injury. And the 23-year-old American Duncan McGuire scored the winner for Orlando City as his stock continues to rise. Then the last thing I want to touch on is that Tanner Tessman scored twice in Venezia's 2-0 win over Brescia. Today, Venezia with Tanner Tessman and Gianluca Busio as their talisman players are currently third in Serie B with five games left to play. They are solidly in the promotion playoff, but only three points behind Nico Giacchini's Como. Okay, Tom, on to a new segment where we talk about mailbag questions. These questions come directly from the It's Called Soccer Discord server. So if you do want to chat with us throughout the week, get your questions in. It's easy to join. Just click on the link in the description below. So first one up from Tobes Zaroni. If you had to pick one midfield three to play in every Copa America match, assuming everyone's healthy, who do you pick and why is it Weston McKinney, Tyler Adams, and Gio Reyna? It's the obvious choice. That's that's the three I'm going with. It seems like it's the perfect mix of good defensive work rate, 
good ball skills, ball progression, ability to unlock a defense. I think there are situations where you might go away from them, but I don't think any of those are like starting situations. I feel like those this is the the three that you have to sort of settle things down, put out fires, and then go forward and unlock whatever defenses we're gonna face. So, and then you look at the bench. You've got players that come in and replace them. You've got Musa. You've got Cardoso. You've got Tillman. And even below that, Maloney, you've got De La Torre, you've got Aronson. It feels like we're about three deep now for for options to sort of have a three-man midfield. And that but I don't think any of them are touching the first first three. You don't think Musa is even close? I I think Musa's probably the closest, but his situation he's one of those players who game state kind of limits him. I think he's really, really good in situations where we're being pressed and he can use his ball progression to completely unlock a defense. Mm-hmm. However, against teams who are just conceding the entirety of the midfield to us and only sort of engaging in our attacking and their defensive third, you kind of lose 80% of the value of Musa as a player, it feels like. And so until he adds a little bit more to his game, I just don't see him being that useful in like every situation like those other three are. Was it always like this or do you, or was the only thing that changed Gio Reyna's health? I don't, I think because it was for, yeah. Like where I come from that is, when we were at the world cup in 2022, the MMA midfield was everything for us. Like it was potentially one of the best top five midfields in the world cup group stage. And it was all of our youngers, young, youngins, <laughs> youngers. Um, but Gio Reyna didn't really feature as much as people would like him to, but now two years down the road, do you feel like it's just that Gio Reyna is now available and healthy? And that's the only thing that's changed. I think it's, a lot of new data that's come in like we've seen musa a lot more for clubs we've seen a little bit more of what his limitations are and we've seen what reyna can do and how he can evolve as a player and we've actually gotten to see him in the midfield he was hurt for so much before the world cup we never really got to try that it didn't really feel like that was an option um, just because he was hurt for like 18 months leading up to the world cup so i i think that there are still limited situations where mma midfield is probably better than having reyna in the midfield Basically, I think that maybe like top 10 teams in the world, teams where we're not going to have a lot of the ball, where you can just sort of have three guys flying around the field and playing defense. Yeah, that seems like the MMA midfield is kind of tailor-made for that. But in any situation where we're expecting to have the ball, it kind of feels like Gio Reyna does a little bit, offers you a little bit more going forward, not just playing defense than Musa does. I don't know if that makes any yeah, sense. It, it does. And in Copa America, really are most difficult group stage game is going to be against Uruguay. And Who's going to let us have the ball. Like, they're, they're kind of a defense and counterattack yeah. type of team. We saw that. We played a friendly against them yeah. recently. So yeah. Cavani nearly hit me in recently. the head in that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like that is really going to be the only game where you could even say that the teams are close in terms of ELO, ELO and, uh, and FIFA rankings. But for the most part, the way that they're going to play is going to be to give us the ball anyway so i i do agree with you there um uh, panama's been uh, evolving be... they they've been playing a little bit more wanting to play like, come at teams a little bit more but i don't think they're very good at it yet um so <laughs> we'll, we'll take that <laughs> yeah we will Bolivia's take that as a gonna opponent, sit... we will take that yeah Bolivia's is gonna sit back and play defense and be pretty bad panama will probably try and play against us and not gonna be super like good at it probably but yeah uruguay is the one to worry about and it's going to be tough for both teams because essentially the way it's probably going to play out is that the second place for our group is going to play Brazil in the first knockout round because Brazil will likely win their group. So that that final game is the U.S. versus Uruguay game. It's the third game of the group. Both teams are going to circle that one and be like, that's the most important because we need to win. We need to be better than the the other team because we don't want to play Brazil in that first knockout. Although, do you want to play Colombia either? I want to play Colombia way more than I want to play Brazil. Colombia just beat Brazil and Argentina back to back away in World Cup qualifying last month or two or last two windows ago. <laughs> I'm still taking it. Like <laughs> the Brazil flag strikes fear in me <laughs> on on a soccer level. You know, argue. Yeah, I, I get that, but arguably Colombia is just nearly as good as Brazil. Like, it is crazy how good of a year they've had in the last year. And Uruguay is not far away. Like, 
Argentina is probably the best in yeah. common ball, and it's not close. But there's a tier of three below them who are still all three of them are top 10 teams in the world. And I don't want to play any of them. But all three of those teams are going to be our quarterfinal and semifinal potential opponents. Yeah, it's kind of all you can ask for from the perspective of a U.S. fan that is thinking about, oh, you know, we need to get our signature wins. Well, pretty much everyone that we meet in the knockout rounds and Uruguay in the group stage is going to be a chance to get a signature win. We're on the other side of the bracket. It's pretty much what Argentina and Mexico like Ecuador. There's not really that team. tier two team. Yeah. So Ecuador versus Colombia mm-hmm. or Uruguay. Like, yeah, you, ha- you have number two, three, four, and five on one side of the bracket and one and six on the other. Yeah. But you know, we're calling for that signature win. We're going to get plenty of chances to do that or mm-hmm. lose and fall on our faces. Um, all right, next up, Dust Josh asks us, who is going to have a Ream-esque resurgence for 2026? What old man is going to come back to haunt the U.S. national team? I don't know that this happens very often. It doesn't seem like I can. we can expect it every World Cup. Do you think that that's probably a fair assessment? Yeah, and I had a real difficult time trying to find a player that fit this mold for me. Um, I know before we started recording, you mentioned, is Zach Steffen old enough to fit this mold? Because he's a name. Um, He was kind of like the first natural name that came and popped up into my mind. I want to throw a name out there that is probably not in the Tim Ream tier of national team, but I really feel like there is going to be a time where Lyndon Gooch can play a, can play for this national team, can play a part in adding value to this national team. This is a player that has essentially been on Sunderland for the entirety of his career. He's 28 years old. He's currently injured. So I'm not saying anytime soon in the next month or two, he's going to have this resurgence. But I feel like in the championship for a great team, he was captain when he played for them. Like, there's no reason why being promoted as captain in your late 20s for a championship club that is going to the Premier League and bringing them back is, like, that player should be an option, at least. That's and kind of the Tim Ream story. Kind of right back, right wing back. Yeah, exactly. It is a Tim Ream story. <laughs> so I know we have those positions kind of covered, but I don't know. Lyndon Gooch is kind of the name that not only came to mind for this, but made a lot of sense when I started to think more about it. Can he play left back? I'm sure he could if we asked him to <laughs> and invited him to the national team camp. That would be my but the the position that we would need him most. That or right back. Like if if he can play outside back, sure, call him up right now and let's see what he can do. That's a good shout. It feels like this question is kind of set up to say John Brooks. Do you see John Brooks as being an option for this? I mean, he's definitely an option for this question. I don't think he's an option for <laughs> Mr. Greggy B. Yeah, that's probably fair. I Brooks's physical limitations make it hard to see him going in the same direction as Reem. Like, I, I know Reem's yeah, always been the fastest, but, like, Bur- Brooks is slow. Like, incredibly, incredibly slow. Every time you watch him play, if he steps into the midfield, he's just erased from the play. He either wins the ball or you're playing down a man in your defense. You have to build a team around him. And it just doesn't feel like that limitation's going away anytime soon. And I'd rather build around other players. It's crazy to think that that conversation probably applied to Tim Ream five years ago. Like, we probably thought of Tim Ream as a slow (laughs) center back that can't really play a high line. And he's just good at passing, like... That is kind of the same conversation that we have for, or the same way we think about John Brooks. Yeah, to be fair, we were playing Tim Ream at left back five years ago. You're right. You're right. (laughs) Damn it, Tom. You're always right. Um, Yeah, he's definitely not fast enough to play play an outside back. But maybe when we play a three-in-the-back system, Tim Ream or John Brooks, John Brooks, that's your chance. A chance to come back. All right, Tom. And last up, Anonymous asked, who are your top three guys that you want to shout out that you think will break into the team for the 2026 World Cup? Someone that is uh, going to be a regular, like you could say a guy like Josh Sargent or Haji Wright, 
since as of recently, they haven't been the number one. I, so you could think to the regulars. I think that the regular names that come to mind, you know, Sergeant Wright or good ones. Brendan Aronson is a guy who could easily find himself back in the picture. Leonard Maloney. Um, but I want to sort of take this more in the direction of uh, prospects who have a chance to break in. I feel like that's a much more interesting question than like what guys are going to get hot at the right time. Um, it feels like there's four position groups that could we could actually have someone break in. It feels like there are center backs, outside backs, wingers, and goalkeepers. Um, from my center back like picks, I think that the the names there's names like Trusty McKenzie and CCV like Carter Vickers who could like find themselves as regulars. But I think Jalen Neal's like the prospect for me that could really like be the next to break in. And outside back, I mean Wiley scored a banger today for Atlanta. Caleb Wiley, John Tolkien is still an option, like. Both of those guys could be big names for us going forward. Jonathan Gomez still exists. Um, at winger, Kevin Paredes, Luca Coliosho, Cade Cowell could put it together, Diego Luna, Quinn Sullivan, they're always sort of breaking down the door. And then in the goalkeeper realm, Chris Brady, Patrick Schulte had a great CONCACAF Champions League appearance this last week. Slanina is still around and getting absolutely peppered at UPenn. Um, so, like, they're, they're a bunch of Drake names Tyler. out there. Drake Callender, I mean, he, I think he's probably a little too old for me. I think he's kind of the next generation of MLS lifer goalkeepers. A really good one. But True. He is 26. Yeah. Um, him and Celentano, I think, are just a little too old for me to really see them making that move. But I don't know. Did any of those names strike you as someone who could apply to this question? Yeah. And by the way, I love when the best thing that you can say about a player is that they still exist. That's the greatest <laughs> compliment that you can give someone. <laughs> no, I I think um, Mark McKenzie is probably, or CCV, like those are pretty natural players when you think about who can break into the center back pool. And to be realistic, like Tim Ream is not going to be around forever as much as we want him to be. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a need for another center back to be the starter for us whether that, you know, is someone that's next to Chris Richards or Miles Robinson to continue to develop and, and get minutes in MLS. Like there are a lot of players that can fit that mold. And at some point, Tim Ream will need to move out of that position and either be, you know, a player coach or just not on the team at all. I think from the the goalkeeper perspective, while I love that Gaga Slanina is getting peppered with shots, he's not on the best team. Like, you want him to be it's it's this weird thing right of like if you're a goalkeeper do you want them facing a lot of shots or do you want them to be on a good team and like dominate with the ball get get more touches with his feet like i don't really know which which way that conversation goes and then the one you mentioned too which i'm really high on just because i watch him week in and week out i'm a fan of the team and the the club that he plays for but john tolkien i just feel like there's nothing this man can't do with his short socks and his crazy hairstyles, like talk about drama and like just craziness on the national team. I feel like John Tolkien will bring that, but he's, he's an amazing player too. Like such a two way player that can play great in defense, his attacking ability, his passing range, like it's just phenomenal. I, I can't wait to see where he goes in Europe. He's crushing it for, for New York Red Bulls this season. They're on a hot streak. Like they're in second place in the East right now. So I could definitely see John Tolkien being kind of the next, whether Anthony Robinson is unavailable or we need that backup to really solidify themselves. I think John Tolkien is a really good shout at left back. Yeah, I, I think that Wiley, he has all the physical tools. Like, I mean, look at that shot today. It was wild. And, you know, I think that his positioning still needs a little work. He still, you know, is a little raw, but he is, he's got all the tools to be a really special player going forward. And I think he's not far away from making a move away from MLS. So... Both of those guys, yeah, I think, are... It was great. Yeah. I, they're both really good outside back prospects. I'm really excited for both of them moving forward. Yeah. Any strikers that catch your eye? I don't know. It's so hard. I Maybe Kirol Figueroa, but I don't think he's sort of this next World Cup cycle. I think you give him another cycle. Um, beyond that, there's not a lot of options. Jesus Ferreira is still around. Um <laughs> Brandon he Vasquez, still exists. <laughs> he's been hurt, so he hasn't really even like gotten to play any minutes in MLS this year. Brandon Vasquez is currently the Golden Boot leader in Mexico, so like 
or if he's not he's pretty close he's way up there um so it could see vasquez maybe making a push but i think you'd have to leave mexico for it um yeah a striker is so deep i feel like the reason i omit striker in all the midfield positions is i feel like they're the deepest pools in europe right now which is wild considering we have spent a lot of time talking about both of those positions and how much we need options but like, we're three deep in the midfield, we're five deep at striker if you include Jordan P. Fox. So, it feels like if someone's going to break in, it's going to be at one of those other position groups. Kevin, uh, Kevin Sullivan will be 16 years old <laughs> at the time. So, who knows? Yeah. That could be an option. Could be an option. I, I really want Cade Cowell to figure, figure it all out and become a really good option. Like, it seems like he has goes on these spurts where he produces a lot in a short time and you're like oh wow he's finally figured it out and then he goes on spurts where he's not doing anything for his club he's currently one of those right now so i i if he ever puts it together he's gonna be a monster but i just i don't know if it's if he's ever gonna do it we've been saying that for six years <laughs> with this guy <laughs> if he yeah. could just be consistent and not be on co- holding hot and cold streaks he'd be golden I, I feel like Cade Cowell as a player is just someone playing Dungeons and Dragons for as a soccer player, and like every single time they try to do anything, they have to roll a d twenty, and whatever the result <laughs> is, is what ends up happening. Sometimes you roll a natural twenty, and he gets like the most amazing pass or shot, and sometimes he rolls a five and <laughs> puts the ball in like the skill fifth check. <laughs> <laughs> Fails the skill check. Fails the yeah. shot check. All right, Tom. That's it for our mailbag. Thank you, everyone, so much for. Uh, sending those in. If, again, if you do want to ask us those questions or chat to us throughout the week, you can join the Discord. The link is down below in the description. That's it for this week. There was a lot going on, but it felt very concentrated in the players and the clubs that we're talking about. So next week, we will be back. The Premier League race is heating up. I just want to ask you, who do you think is going to win the Premier League between Arsenal, Liverpool, and Manchester City? Uh, I'm going to put my money on Liverpool, but I could be completely wrong there. Manchester City is now not only in the lead, but in uh, in control of their own destiny. So I feel bad for all of the other teams that have to catch up to them now. Now that they're in there, I'm going to turn it on and win in 15 straight games for the rest of the year. Yeah, hopefully they don't. I would catch. like to see a new winger, winner. That would be nice. But, you know, not everyone can be the Bundesliga this year, Tom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, that's True. it for this episode. Uh, Tom, what do you have to say to the people? Uh, just, I don't know. Hope you guys enjoy all the fun soccer that's coming up. Um, uh, all the lower leagues are heating up, so if you've got a team near you, maybe go check it out. Chattanooga just erased Miami FC2 from existence uh, this weekend, which was really fun to see. Um, one six two, Not 1-6-2. <laughs> it, it was a brutal, brutal game to watch if you're an Inter-Miami Academy fan, but, you know. Fun stuff going on in the lower leagues. Hope you guys get a chance to, to take in some action or maybe MLS in the near future. Um, yeah, beyond that, just thanks for having me, Jake. Of course, you're you're part of this, Tom. You're, you're 50% <laughs> of this. Uh, I also love, not only did you say that uh, players exist, but you also just mentioned the three <laughs> Inner Miami Academy fans that exist. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I just want to thank everyone so much for, for watching, for listening. Again, remember the best thing, the biggest thing that you can do for us is leave a positive review or if you listen to your podcast. If you are watching this on YouTube, it would do us uh, so much if you could share this with any soccer curious friends. Upcoming this week is the second leg of the Champions League and the Europa League and Europa Conference Leagues. And then uh, an, some more club football coming at us next weekend. So we'll be back next Monday to chat through it all and all of the U.S goals, assists, and storylines that will happen. Until next time, peace out, everybody. <laughs>